The Witch of Beacon Hill by Paul M. Levitt with John Woodvine as Leroy Crandon, Shelley Thompson as his wife Minna, Kerry Shale as James Malcolm Bird, and Nigel Anthony as Harry Houdini. Oh, Mama, how I loved you. Speak to me, Mama. Please, just once. Speak to me. Two gardeners have gone to spiritualists. I asked them only one thing. Let me speak to my blessed mother. Cost is no obstacle. I'll pay any amount. You want my left eye? Both eyes. I hate them. They call themselves sensitives. Monsters is what they are. Promising to... Bring your blessed spirit to me, and instead, cheap carnival tricks. I promise, Mama, they will not betray others as they have betrayed me. I'll expose them to the ends of the earth. I will make every last one of them fear the name Harry Houdini. The action of the play begins in Beacon Hill, a district of Boston, Massachusetts, in 1923, at the house of Leroy Crandon and his wife Minna, the internationally renowned medium. Oh, excuse me, sir, but uh, Mr. Bird has just arrived. Thank you, Laura. Very sorry, I couldn't get a cab. The snow, I guess. Well, now that you're here, will you please be seated by your name card, and I'll formally introduce everyone else. Thank you. On my right is Caroline Churchill, and next to her, her sister Winifred. The Churchills are Bostonians for more than 60 years. We live just a few blocks away, half the years. At the far end of the table is Dr. Frederick Caldwell, our family dentist, and a frequent sitter at our seances. Hello, everyone. And next, Mr. Reginald Gray. It's his first visit. Oh, just call me Reg. Reg is a civil servant in the local tax office. And our latecomer is Mr. Bird. Mr. J. Malcolm Bird, associate editor of the distinguished magazine, The Scientific American. How do you do? He is here to investigate the authenticity of my wife's mediumship. What's there to investigate? She has restored my faith in life. Yes, oh, well, indeed. not everyone, Frederick, feels as you do. Pity. Yes, it yes, is. Indeed. For a great many people, seances excite suspicion. Now, I've asked you all to check for trapdoors, secret closets, trick panels, hidden confederates, openings to other rooms, wires, anything. Oh, nothing, Leroy, nothing. Room is sealed tight. Well, then I'll explain tonight's proceedings. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bird and I will serve as controls for Psyche, which is my pet name for my wife. We will each hold one of her hands and press a leg against one of hers. For your part, you must clear your mind of suspicion. Otherwise, the seance will have no validity for you. Then I suggest you think of a lost friend and pray for contact with the other world. A successful seance really does depend upon mental vibrations and your willingness to believe. What if you dial the wrong number and the person at the other end of the line is not the person you want to talk to? Mr. Gray, we may invite the spirits, but we are not to blame for which of them appears. We don't manufacture them. Where's the music coming from? The other world. Here she comes. Oh, you can feel the cold breeze. Ladies and gentlemen, Psyche. As you can see, she's wearing slippers, silk stockings, and a diaphanous dressing gown, revealing nature's loveliness beneath, so you can see that she is concealing nothing on her person. Now, Mr. Bird, if you will take her left hand, I'll hold her right. Yes. Now place your right leg against her left. That's it, and I'll control her right leg with my left. There. Now, Dr. Caldwell, will you please turn off the white light and turn on the red? Uh, of course. Psyche will now ready herself to pass into a trance. Then her spirit guide, Walter Stinson, will make his presence known. Walter is Psyche's brother. He was killed in a train accident. Uh, when did this Walter kick off? Twelve years ago, in 1911. What happened? A boxcar overturned and crushed him. He must have been just a kid. Twenty-eight. Oh, once you pass fifty, like me, twenty-eight's not even dry behind the ears. Here he comes. Oh, yes, here comes Walter. I'm so exciting. The same. <laughs> Hello, Walter. Where have you been? Oh, I had to take my girl to the hayloft. <laughs> May I speak to him? Ask him what you wish. Uh, can you read my mind, Walter? Yes, but you wouldn't want me to tell anyone about that. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
You dance with pretty girls? At the Charleston. And do the hoochie-coochie? Every night. But if you're just a spirit, just air without a body, uh, how do you... Do the hoochie-coochie? With spirits! <laughs> Walter, we have someone here today from the Scientific American. Someone who's to determine if you're real or just a projection of Psyche's voice. What's your name? J. Malcolm Bird. I'm a journalist and a student of the supernatural. Oh, formal. I think I'll call you Birdie. Walter, you're entirely too familiar. Oh, don't be a stuffed shirt, Dr. Leroy Goddard Crandon. Even your name's pompous. So, Birdie... You're here to find out if I'm real. What do you think so far? You sound real. I'm just as real as you. But can you make yourself visible? I am visible. I can't see you. Of course you can. You hear but me. What do you look like? Just listen, and you'll see. At the moment, you're nothing but a disembodied voice coming through a void. Oh, supposing you could touch me. Would that make any difference? We're both bound by the same limitations. We speak, but who hears us? The person next to us? <laughs> Perhaps. God? Who knows? And then the sound is gone. Unless, of course, some instrument of memory captures what we say and saves it for a future time. The magazine I represent is looking for physical evidence of the spirit world, not philosophy. Then how less? Oh. Oh. The table's still. There's more to come. Ah, some fly around the room and just rushed past me. It's a pigeon. Dr. Caldwell knows all my tricks, don't you, Freddy? How did a pigeon get in the room? I brought it with me when I came through the wall. You transported a live creature through a material object? It's a cinch. <laughs> Walter is playing games with us, aren't you, Walter? All right, you don't like the bell. I'll give you something better to listen to. The music sounds so close, just, just across the room. Walter, what news from the spirit world? The great war, as we know, left 10 million young men dead on the ground. Many of their families longed to speak to them. Isn't that so? Isn't that why you're here, Mr. Gray? <laughs> how, how did you know? Your son's here with me. Jonathan! I'm safe now, Dad. I've crossed over. It's him. It's my son. I think of you and Mother every day. Oh. It's a miracle! Psyche's a miracle! The spirit lives! We'll talk again! Soon! Bye, Dad! My beloved Jonathan! Alive! Was that the clock downstairs? No, Bertie, that one keeps good time. Right now it's nearly ten o'clock. Time for me and Jonathan to disappear. So hey, stay! Walter must have left. I feel the breeze again. Mrs. Cranford stirring. She's emerging from her trance. This, this is the greatest day of my life. I must talk to her. Once Walter goes, my wife is utterly exhausted, Mr. Gray. She retires to her room in order to recover. Oh, oh I'm I, sure I you understand. Now, if you wish to meet her in person, just call ahead. Tomorrow, though, she'll be unavailable. She's spending the day with Mr. Bird. Now, I'll see you all to the door. And to think some newspapers attack her and call her the witch of Beacon Hill. <laughs> oh, oh, Bertie. Oh, I like that. I'll call you Bertie, too, unless, of course, you don't want me to. Why, I'd be flattered, Mrs. Grandin. It's like a nickname, just like Leroy always calls me Psyche, an affectionate nickname. Yes, well, of course. Good reason to use it, then, I, I guess. You are such a goose. Or should I say bird, blushing about a name? Now, if I had called you dear or honey or, or lover, then you'd have cause to be flustered. Uh... So tell me, what did you think of last night's seance? I'd have to say it was quite convincing. I wanted you to like I it. I did. Do you mind if I play? Please do. Schubert. I'm indebted to Conan Doyle for recommending me to you. Sir Arthur swears you're for real, the genuine article, someone who can honestly prove the presence of the spirits. And you want me to apply for this prize of yours? Yes. But surely I'm at a disadvantage. Your contest rules disallow the very type of spiritualism I engage in, spirit messages. To win, you need only have Walter create a physical effect, like ring a bell in another part of he the room. He already does that, and many other things when he's in the mood. I know, that's why I think you'll be a cinch to win the prize. Oh, I don't know. You see, my real power lies in spirit messages, not bell ringing. 
Why not test Stuart and Mrs. Thompson? Frauds, both of them. Oh, what an awful word, fraud. I'd rather die than be judged a fraud. There's no chance of that. You don't understand. All mediums face the same problem. If we don't have a decent degree of freedom within our bonds, our materializing powers are absolutely inhibited. Why worry? Your seances proceed without a hitch. Not always. Are you afraid the Scientific American contest will inhibit you? It all depends on the test conditions. At the moment, you know, I'm under a cloud of suspicion. Why? A few days ago, a team of investigators from Harvard... I know the group. Well, two of them came to the house to test my powers. They saw Walter make a piano stool glide down the hall. So what's the problem? They claim it was all a cheat, a fraud. They said someone in the cellar was pulling on a string wrapped around the leg of a stool. Did they see the string? No. Did they check the cellar? Yes, and found no one. Well, then you've been acquitted. Hardly. They're still convinced I have a confederate. <laughs> Shall we tiptoe around looking under tables and in teacups for my accomplice? <laughs> you did see the maid lurking in the cellar, didn't you? Oh, yes, next to the old heating duct. With a ball of string in her hand. Threading it through the register she was. Oh, poor Laura, she is so dim that if she were my confidant, she'd probably announce in the door of the seance room, Oh, you've set the clocks, Mrs. Crandon, and I put the record on the Victrola just as you directed. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we search the cellar together? Well, I'll just string along with you. But what if we should get too close? You would tug at my heartstrings. If I did, I'm afraid your husband would string me up. I could speak to him on your behalf, pull some strings. In this short time, I've grown so fond of you, Bertie. But your husband? Dr. Crandon's 20 years my senior. He's a surgeon and professor. You're a journalist and teacher. He's rich. And you are tall with a mass of wavy brown hair that falls across your forehead. He has a yacht. And you wear old suits and wire-rimmed spectacles. I have to leave tomorrow. And then all this loveliness and laughter... If you're not coming back, you mustn't fall in love with the medium. In my articles for the magazine, I shall call you Marjorie. Marjorie the medium. And you may be sure that I will be back. Come in, Mrs. Corbridge. When I called your old office, the secretary said you were no longer with the medical school. I insisted I had to see you, so she gave me this address. Ah, it's been a few years since I left Harvard, Mrs. Corbridge. Now, how can I help you? A couple of months ago, I felt a lump under my arm. A head test. A biopsy. They suggested a surgeon, someone else. I said I wanted to see you. Why did you leave the medical school, Dr. Crandon? They disapproved of my interest in spiritualism. If you agree with them, I can recommend another surgeon. Not to me, you can't. You're my doctor. I trust you. I brought along the lab report. It's in my purse. Here. It's not good, is it? Conventional medicine can do nothing. But spiritualism, especially in cases like this, can often work miracles. I'd suggest you consult my wife. She can communicate with the spirits. But can she heal? To speak to the spirits, Mrs. Corbridge, is to dispel the fear of death. And once the dread of death is gone, we begin to heal. One hears so much talk these days about spiritualism and Houdini and fraud. If you're skeptical, I'll put you in touch with the Churchill sisters. Minna's done wonders for them. You think it's all right, then? She's a miracle worker. Not only does she speak to the spirits, but she also looks into the future. Really? There's no one like her. What would it cost? Nothing. She doesn't charge. Well, if surgery is out... It can't help. Then what have I to lose? What is all this, George? Some kind of inquisition? Just listen to us, Leroy. Well, she's not the first. You have to she's admit... She's incurable, George. The cancer has metastasized. She has nothing to lose by attending a seance. We can't help it's her. It's unprofessional. You give us all a bad name. Unprofessional? Don't be so goddamn melodramatic, Reuben. I'm sorry. Look, how did this news get around in the first place? She told Nurse Comedy, and now we're all a laughing stock. Henry, you're open-minded. You pride yourself on being fair. George and Reuben, I know, won't even entertain the idea of sitting through a seance. True. That's right. Come and see for yourself, Henry. If you find it's all a sham, I'll never mention the subject around here again, I promise. And if I don't find it a sham? Then I trust, as an honorable man, you'll say so. I'm late. Call, Henry. Please do. I'll tell Minna to expect you. Now, excuse me. A 
And what will you do if you go to their house and discover she is a fraud? Tell the truth. I guarantee you, George. Anything Henry says that isn't positive will be utterly ignored. They say it all got out of hand when he suffered a loss of position and prestige at Harvard and then joined our practice. I don't believe that. I've known Leroy Cranham for 20 years, even knew his first two wives. He was always a connoisseur of good living and beautiful women. But these last few years, he's become obsessed with death and dying. Minna had nothing in common with him. The marriage began to falter. So to save herself and her financial interests, she turned this spiritualism game into something serious, convincing Leroy of the life to come. She's no fool. He doesn't seem to mind. To the contrary, he loves the notoriety. The famous and the rich flock to 10 Lime Street to see Minna and to have Leroy entertain and lecture them. <laughs> the danger is he's begun to regard himself as a martyr to the cause of science, a sort of second Galileo. In that case, Minna's little scheme has backfired. She'll always have to play the medium. Well, that's one way to make a marriage work. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go, Henry? Of course. I've nothing to lose. What a day, constantly besieged. Uh, now, there's a fancy word. I wonder where I learned it. Not, not in the train yard. Besieged by a Mr. Corbridge. Charles, that's my husband. And by a Samuel Zimmerman, who says he's the grandfather of Henry Zimmerman, a doctor. Are you there, Henry? Yes, I'm here. I knew it all the time. God, what a day when my heart was hot to play. God, what a day in the love and field away. Walter, Walter, nothing, Bordy. I told you what I guess to look I know, for. I know. What a stick in the mud you are. No fun at all. I wonder how Minna stands you. What did the spirit say? Old Mr. Corbridge, bald as a bowling ball and wearing a large belt buckle with a bucking bronco engraved oh, on that's it. that's him. That's Charles. He bought it in Wyoming. He loved that buckle. Oh, tell me, what did he say? He said you're not to worry. That you're not due to cross over for at least three more years. And that he can't wait to see you. He even told me what he plans to do the first night you're together. That'll be quite <laughs> enough, Walter. Anything else of real importance? I'd call that important. But then what would you know of shimmy and shake? Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Samuel Zimmerman. What of him? You really want to hear? Of course. You're sure now? We're sure. Absolutely sure. With sugar and spice and everything nice on We're it. waiting, oh, Walter. All right, all right. Be a spoil sport. Walter, I'm losing patience. Mr. Samuel Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Uh, yes, an elderly man. Well dressed, speaks several languages. His English is accent, a diamond stick pin in his tie. My God. He's actually talked to my grandfather. He told me the whole story, Henry, of how you became a doctor. If you know that, then there can be no doubt that our spirit survives death. Your grandfather also told me how he scandalized the family by running off with a fortune teller in Mannheim, leaving behind a wife and son. My grandmother and father. When you wanted to go to college, your father objected. He wanted you, his only son, to go into his no. business. You refused, saying you wanted to be a doctor, not a cigar manufacturer. He disinherited me. But your grandfather paid all your college bills. I adored him. He was the most generous man who ever lived. When he was buried, the other mourners had to prevent you from jumping into the open grave after him. Every night after dinner, he would play the piano. Schubert was his favorite. He said no one could equal the soul of Schubert. Mrs. Corbridge, the maid said. Oh, I, I told her I would only stay a minute. I know you're busy. Well, there's nothing wrong, I hope. Wrong? Oh. I've never been so happy in my life. Psyche has completely changed my life. She's given me faith. To be frank with you, when I came here the other day, I was skeptical, but now, well, 10 Lime Street is like a holy shrine to me. Oh, there, I've said it. Now I have to go. Thank you, Mrs. Corbridge. I'll tell her what you said. Oh, and also tell her. I've decided to give a thousand dollars to charity to show my appreciation. Oh, that's the point of good works, isn't it? One good deed leads to another. May God bless you both. Always. I'll, I'll see myself out. I'm impressed. You heard. Yes, I was just on my way upstairs to listen to Minna. I eavesdropped. A year ago, nobody had heard of her. Now look. 
I can't tell you how proud I am to have played a part in her recognition. Speaking of playing, I can't get over her musical skills. It's too bad she never had the chance to study piano seriously. That's just what Henry Zimmerman said. I guess you know he's now a rock-ribbed convert to the cause. Dr. Crandon, Walter's foul language and his word choice convince me beyond a doubt that Minna isn't speaking. Rather, Walter's speaking through her. I am troubled by one thing, though. Oh? What's that? Well... Some of Walter's pranks seem to originate not with him, but with Minna. It detracts from the real thing, from her real powers to play such cheap tricks. What's the alternative? To disappoint the faithful and delight the skeptics? Aren't you just claiming the end justifies the means? And if it doesn't, what does? I assume that's why you wrote that wonderful Marjorie the Medium article. To invite belief in Minna's powers. I wrote it to celebrate the real thing, not to encourage deception. And you weren't wrong. As you'll see. When Minna wins the prize. The contest? Y you think she might agree to enter? That's why I asked you to return to Boston. When I suggested it, she turned me down. She said if spirit messages were out, she was out. I've talked to her about it. The real question is whether her entering the contest will help or hinder the cause of spiritualism. She'll turn the scientific community on its collective ear. She'll carry the day for spiritualism. I just know it. And if she does... She'll be famous. I'll call Orson Munn, my editor, immediately. And the newspapers. I'll write the news release myself. Let's go up and tell her. Oh, and Malcolm. No more talk of counterfeit or deception. Okay. Minna, we've something to tell you. Now, what have you two cooked out? A delicious stew. More like an elegant dessert. <laughs> to top off your accomplishments. Flattery is never free. What have you involved me in now? Well, I gather Leroy thinks that you should enter the Scientific American contest, and I agree. Leroy. It's the final test. But haven't I... Proved their spirit life after death? Yes, for me, for Malcolm, for the Churchill sisters, and for numerous others. Amateurs, but not for the scientific world. If they're convinced... Then you'll believe, for certain. Not just believe. No. Who else is on the judging committee? Well, I'm just the secretary, so I don't vote. And I guess the other names won't mean anything to you, except for Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini? Absolutely not. He hates spiritualists. He's crazy on the subject. A madman. I will not be judged by Harry Houdini. Minna, think it's a chance to beat the greatest skeptic of them all. No. The last obstacle. No. It's what I... What we've been waiting for, the chance of a lifetime. No, no, no. For God's sake, Leroy. And don't badger me. <laughs> Minna, listen, if Harry Houdini can be convinced, there's no one else. No one can challenge your legitimacy ever again. You know what this means, Leroy. Of course. Since I'm not permitted spirit messages, everything depends on my being able to ring bells and tip tables to animate the inanimate. Believe me, I'm just as scared as you, but consider the stakes. With this challenge, you have the opportunity to beat the great Harry Houdini. Convince the world that there is life after death. And for those stakes, you are willing to... To risk everything, yes. I'm willing to risk that. Definitely. This is Radio WOR Boston. For some time now, the American public has been wondering whether Marjorie the Medium is the real thing. Mr. Bird, is Marjorie the real thing? <clears throat> well, that is uh, for the experts to decide, but there's certainly no doubt that a lot of people think she is genuine. Do you count yourself among those people? I count myself one of the lucky ones to have experienced her unique ability. I'd say you're convinced. My vote doesn't count. I'm not one of the judges. Who are? Well, there are five. Professor William McDougall, head of psychology at Harvard. Uh -huh. Mr. Harrowood Carrington, a professional investigator of spiritualist claims. Dr. Daniel Frost Comstock, professor of physics at MIT. Dr. Walter Franklin Prince, a research officer of the American Society of Psychical Research. And the fifth member is the eminent escapologist, Harry Houdini. Whom everyone knows hates spiritualists. Can he be unbiased? Mr. Houdini insists he's open-minded. Is he? Well, let us just say that having seen and debunked no end of tricksters, he retains a healthy skepticism. I suppose, then, if he's convinced... There can be no doubt. And if he's not? Mr. Houdini has never been shy about denouncing those he exposes as frauds. Bertie. Oh. Lilith. I heard what you said on the radio, but I'm terrified. 
What's the matter? Well, everyone says that since his mother died, Houdini attends seances only to ridicule anyone who professes to be a medium. I'm afraid it's true. He's been to hundreds of dishonest mediums, each one promising to put him in touch with his mother. Every time they fail, he grows more desperate. I could reach her through Walter. Don't even try, I warn you. When Lady Conan Doyle claimed to have gotten through, he disputed her evidence and caused a rupture with Sir Arthur. Houdini doesn't believe it's possible to cross over, even though he wants to, desperately. But don't you see, Bertie? His mother's the key. Stay away from her, Minna. And the kind of parlor tricks that dishonest mediums engage in, the kind that Walter sometimes likes to play. I... So warn him. I won't have Walter ridiculed. I had a childhood of that listening to the ravings of my father. I didn't mean to... Every time that bastard spoke, it was to give an order and humiliate us. But... One time, Walter and I dressed up in each other's clothes. He was wearing my summer dress and I had on his overalls. And wouldn't you know it, father walked in. He started screaming at us that only the devil put on someone else's clothes. He said we were no better than the Eden snake who was really the devil in disguise. He stripped me to the waist and fondled me, saying, if I was a boy, how come I had these little peaches growing on my chest? Yeah. Then he made Walter go to school in my dress, even though it barely covered him. That was father through and through. Always cruel, always giving orders, sick orders. Oh, why should I listen to Leroy, or for that matter, you? I won't be ordered about. I have nothing to prove. I don't wish to be like your father. Neither, I think, does Leroy. Oh, little you know. I'm sorry, Minna. Truly sorry. I know you are. I didn't mean to be peremptory. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm. Some hurts run awfully deep, don't they? I just got carried away, thinking of the past. Think of the future. Soon you'll be the most celebrated medium in America and Europe. All you have to do is hold Houdini to a draw. I must know everything I can about him. Everything, from his sexual habits to his favorite food, one way or another. <laughs> what is it, Bertie? I know it sounds silly, Minna, but I'm supposed to be impartial. I could lose my job. Ladies never tell. Houdini and I have never been close friends. I've already been told he doesn't approve of my staying here with you and Leroy, so I think it's unlikely he'll confide in me, especially about his sexual habits. Besides, the man's approved. Oh, perhaps he'll change his mind when he sees me in my gown. Minna, how can you say that? Given the last few weeks with the laughter and the love? The string incident. You're not stringing me along. Bertie, I never pull a heart string unless I mean it. Believe me. Mother, this coffee is lousy. I don't know why I let you make it. You're changing the subject, Minna. Why are you doing this? Oh. Why? Because, well, because I have to. Houdin has cancelled his tour to come here. And he's consulting with that old medium, Eva Fay, to learn all the tricks of the trade. There are no tricks, Mother. You ought to know that. Yes, I know, I know. All I meant was you'll have to be in top form. You know how sometimes you can't make contact, sometimes Walter isn't there. Well, with Houdini at your side, you can't afford to misconnect. Walter always protected me from father. I know he'll be there to wrestle with Houdini. Maybe Mr. Bird can help you. He knows Houdini. I know Birdie must be neutral. Birdie, is it? It's the nickname Walter gave him. And your son tells me that he lives here and that you're with him all the time. Well, little John shouldn't be telling his grandmother family secrets. I hope you aren't getting any ideas, Minna. One divorce is enough. And Mother, remember, Leroy takes very good care of you. Mr. Bird is staying here so that he can provide an insider's view of the contest. Once the contest is over, he'll be returning to New York. He's a married man, Minna. You do get around, Mother. With two children, he told me. His wife doesn't share his interests. Well, that's exactly what you said about Earl. He didn't share your interest. Is this marriage going to be a repeat performance of the last? Oh, Mother, you are such a worrywart. You know how I feel about Leroy. He's crazy about he you. He needs me. And you need him. Never forget that, Minna. Yes, I'm sure you're right. A minute. Oh, Mother Stinson, I didn't, that minute didn't tell me you were here. Uh, just stop by for a quick visit. <laughs> Minna, guess who I just spoke to on the phone? Hmm. Eric Weiss. Oh, who, may I ask, is Eric Weiss? Harry Houdini. It's his real name. I'm glad to see you're doing your homework, just as I suggested. Don't I always do what you want, Leroy? Oh, sometimes you misbehave, but only sometimes. With your approval. Why did Mr. Weiss call? He turned us down. 
You mean he won't stay here? No. Said it was unethical. Oh. Are you sure we should go ahead with this, Leroy? Oh, now you're getting smart. You promised me not. What's in it for her? A place in history. A place in history next to Galileo. Well, maybe even if Houdin is not convinced when he hears about all the good the men does, he'll change his mind. Not likely, Mother. But if you run the danger of exposure... How can she if there is life after death? Hi, Pumpkin. It's me, Harry. I just wanted to hear my little bestest voice again because I already miss you, sweetheart. Now, remember, Sugar, I'm staying at the Copley Plaza Hotel and not the Charles Gate. Now, the... Of course I brought my raincoat. Don't I always do whatever you tell me? Your word is my command. I, I wasn't being sarcastic, honey. No, honest. Oh, don't be angry. I swear, I, I wasn't making fun of you. That's better. Look, I, I'll call again tomorrow. A kiss? Here's a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love you too. Bye. Bye. Hi. Hi, Harry. Hi, Harry. Everything okay, Wilson? Oh, sure. Jim and I have just been checking those addresses. Yeah. Oh, right. I'll get it. Hello. Uh, right. No, this is Jim Stop Collins. Right. Yes. Ah, right. <laughs> Once you hear the accent, you know I'm not Harry Houdini. Yes. Uh, one minute. It's for you, Harry. Dr. Crandon. What does he want now? Hello. Yeah, same here, Dr. Crandon. Yeah, I'm sure. Right. I'll see you at dinner tonight. Mm-hmm. Goodbye. Oh, this guy never quits. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't we all like to stay at his place? Sure, sure. Then when we leave, what are we supposed to say? Thanks for the hospitality. And by the way, your wife's a fraud. I thought this guy was a scientist. You know, the first thing about running an experiment. you got to be unprejudiced. Uh, what a business is this going to be? Well, it's almost noon. Bert will be here any minute. I still can't believe it. Him living at the Crandon house is unethical. Uh, do you want to talk to him, Harry, or should I? I'll be my guest. I might just spill the beans. Now, what about those addresses? L. Rand is listed in the phone book. Uh, Gross of 31 chest. Great. Now, what about the Churchill sisters? Carolyn and uh, Winifred? Uh, yeah, 172 Goldsmith Avenue. All right, remember, don't let on nothing. You're just a reporter researching Marjorie the medium. All right. From out of town. <laughs> well, Rand's a natural to talk, but them dames may be a tough nut to crack. Uh, not when James Smooth as Silk Collins goes to work. Let them <laughs> to worry about it. Good boy, Jimmy. Go check him out. Uh, see you later. Bye, Mr. Mudd. Uh, yeah, bye, Jim. Uh... What are you planning to wear tonight? Well, this heat. My seer sucker suit. But I still don't think we should have accepted. Well, you can't refuse all of Crandon's hospitality. Then it begins to look as if you are prejudiced. Yeah, maybe you're right. But once is enough. After tonight, no more dinners, okay? Okay. All my life, I've lived out of a suitcase. Traveling from one city to the next, I can never escape it. You know, the day I retire, I'm going to burn them all. Uh-uh. I'll get it. Malcolm. Orson, glad to see you. Thanks for coming by. Uh, uh, what are you, a cold drink? No, thanks. Nothing. Hello, Harry. What have you been up to? Oh, just covering the Marjorie mediumship from the inside, as I said I would. You're on the inside, all right, right inside the Crandall house. Harry, you yeah, said... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this heat. Malcolm, we are a bit concerned about your um, familiarity with the Crandons. Oh? Uh, a scientific inquiry demands utter and complete disinterestedness. Now, we must all be above suspicion. What are you saying? As editor of the Scientific American, I have to guarantee, uh, you understand, I'm sure, the integrity of the magazine as well as the contest. I think, therefore, we would all be better served. Mind you, there's nothing personal in it if you uh, took a room elsewhere. I can't afford it. You know what a room in Boston goes for? The magazine will pay. Are you accusing me of something, Orson? No, no, not at all, Malcolm. I just want to be sure that no one can question our neutrality. I can't imagine anyone who would. What, are you kidding? Here you move in with this dame, the very one we're testing, and you can't imagine there's anything wrong? Are you nuts? I simply fail to understand the problem, Harry. I'll simply tell you what the problem is. Mrs. Crandon, in order to help you investigate her, invites you to spend your summer vacation alone at her spacious and well-furnished home, even though you're married. She entertains you sumptuously. She gives you three bounteous meals a day, topped off with ice cream and hooch, and a downy bed to sleep on at night. And all at her expense. That's the problem. I don't know what you're implying. 
But just because I've accepted the gracious hospitality of Dr. and Mrs. Crandon does not mean that I'll be biased in her favor. Ah. You could equally make the case that in order to discount the Crandon's hospitality, I'll be unfairly severe. Oh, get serious, Malcolm. Your story on Marjorie the medium all but said that she's a genuine article. When this thing's over, you'll have to say that she's legit. How could you possibly say otherwise? You certainly ain't going to brand your charming host as a liar or a fraud. If that's the way you feel. Yeah, that's the way I feel. And you, Orson, do you agree? Well, I do think, as I said, that uh, if you moved into separate quarters, any breath of suspicion... You realize, Mr. Munn, that I will have to resign my position oh. with the Scientific American if I do not enjoy your confidence. Now, who said anything about resigning? The implications, the drift of your comments would suggest <sighs> that, that you are have... compromised. That's it in a nutshell. Mr. Houdini's charges are very serious. If they're not withdrawn, Mr. Munn, I shall have to leave the magazine. Good day. Well, there's a shot I've had very strong one. I'll settle him down later. Oh, you're so gullible. He thinks you can photograph the soul of a rat as it leaves the remains of the rodent. <laughs> if she's a trickster, Harry, uh, do you suppose the trickery is deliberate or unintentional? Who cares? All I know is a lot of people are being driven mad by spiritualism. Others are killing themselves and sometimes their children in the hope of joining loved ones beyond the grave. Spiritualism claims to bring consolation. It brought none to these people. And it sure ain't brought none to me. God knows I've tried. I've been to mediums all over the world and never met a one with supernatural power. And if you did meet one, Harry, how would you know? I'd hear my sainted mother's voice. How much the carrots? Five cents a bunch. A good buy. How is this lettuce good, Earl? Came in this morning. Hey, excuse yes, me. Can I help you? Uh, Mr. Rand, James Collins. I'm a reporter with the Glasgow Observer. Oh, yes? Something I could do for you, Mr. Collins? Uh, we're gathering material for a story on your ex-wife, uh, Marjorie the Medium, for our readers in Scotland. <laughs> Marjorie, my eye. Her name's Minna. Some newspaper guy gave her this fancy title. She's playing Minna Stinson. Anything else you can tell me? Uh, for example, where she grew up, her interests, your life together, you know, that sort of thing. Hey, listen. She and that new husband buy all their fruits and vegetables from me. They're good customers. I don't want to lose them, understand? Would $25 help? 25 bucks? Hey, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's for any inconvenience I might cause. How's the you. corn? Uh, uh, try the golden bantam. Look, uh, hey. step in the back of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, Nothing too personal, I hope, Mr. Uh... Collins. Uh, the Glasgow Observer is not a scandal sheet, Mr. Rand. We're on a top-notch newspaper. So what do you want to know first? She was born in Canada, right? Right. Grew up on a farm. You don't mind if I unpack the tomatoes while we talk? No, go right ahead. Maiden name Stinson. Yeah, and she became Mrs. Earl P. Rand, September 5th, 1910. But pretty soon she got big ideas. A greengrocer wasn't good enough for her. She walked out on me on Christmas Day in 1917. Christmas Day, can you imagine? Took the kid with her. Married Dr. Crandon three months later. Money. She did it for the money. Why else marry a man old enough to be your father? Any hobbies? Ah, oh, she's a good musician. Plays the piano. Also, the cello and the cornet. She ever do any acting? She was involved with several local theatrical groups. Did impersonations. First-rate stuff. <laughs> I could never tell the difference between the real and the fake. <laughs> like the seances. Hey, now look. All that stuff started after she left me. That spiritualism stuff. You religious? Me? Well, I... I figure religion's got one purpose. To give us life after death. All churches talk about it. But how many of them can really deliver the goods? None, as far as I know. Now, if Minna's able, then she'll put all the churches out of business. Yeah. Instead of showing up for Sunday service, people will be flocking to a seance, to be communing with the spirits. Mm -hmm. She'll be the founder of a new religion, probably the world's biggest. If, of course, she really can make contact with the dead. And if she can't? I know what you're thinking. But even though I'm mad at her for what she did to me, I got to admit, she brings a lot of people comfort. When you called, Mr. Collins, I didn't know what to think. Winifred and I live a rather solitary life. Oh. We don't go out very much anymore. We're getting on in years, you see. Yes. I never knew it. You look like young women. <laughs> oh, surely you tease me. I bet you're out on the town all the time. <laughs> How else would you know Marjorie the medium? Well, that's different. At our age, you start thinking about the afterlife yes. and what's to come. Uh, the assignment I told you about. The uh, story for your newspaper. Uh, right. I'm lacking the sitter's point of view. Oh, oh by the way, I brought a book. Box of chocolates. I hope oh, you like them. Barashini chocolates. <laughs> Caroline's favorite. How did you know? Lucky guess. <laughs> oh, you are a tempter, Mr. Collins. I hope so. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
<laughs> As uh, frequent sitters at the Crandon House, you could provide me with an insider's view, if you see what I mean. Here, you have one, Mr. Collins. Oh, don't mind if I do. Well, Dr. Crandon always does the talking. That is until Walter shows her up. The room is dark and mysterious. Except for red light. You have to do just what Dr. Crandon says, or there's no seance. Marjorie <laughs> comes in after Dr. Crandon's finished talking. She has the most devilish eyes I ever saw in my life. Blue. The women adore her, and all the men love her. If you ever saw her, you'd know why. She's blonde and has a marvelous figure. A wonderful laugh. Oh, she makes you feel so good about yourself. Our only objection is her attire. Yes, our only objection. <laughs> oh, and why is that? Well, it's... Uh... At least to our taste, a bit scandalous. She wears nothing beneath her transparent kimono but stockings and slippers. And sometimes she sprinkles her bosom with phosphorescent powder. So you see what we mean? I can see, yes, indeed I can. She's a trance medium, you know. I guess I hadn't heard. Oh, yes. And after she goes into a trance, Walter shows up. He is her spirit contact. You've never heard such language, Mr. Collins. He is Marjorie, so refined, and Walter has a mouth like a sewer. And when he isn't talking, he's doing tricks. He goes from one to another, and each time we're there, it's different. What's different? His tricks? Yes, he does new ones all the time. Marjorie is so awfully clever, isn't she, Winifred? Clever and charming both. What a dear... They make a lovely couple, she and Dr. Crandon. He absolutely worships her. She is somewhat younger than Dr. Crandon. <laughs> That's probably why he does whatever she commands. Oh. Have you ever asked about Walter's tricks? I mean, how they're done? What is there to ask? It's all coming from the spirit world, through the agency of Walter. Induced, of course, by Marjorie. Oh, it is really quite amazing. I never fail to leave feeling full of hope. Minna seances have completely cured me of my fear of death. You see, Mr. Collins, every time Minna crosses the abyss, she proves that the future and all its bright discoverers will not be blotted out by death. The comfort and the hope that Caroline and I receive from knowing this, I can't begin to tell you. Oh, you really ought to seek admission, Mr. Collins. You'd never be the same again. Mr. Houdini, Mr. Munn. Health and long life. Mina and I welcome you to Boston, to Ten Lime Street, and to the immortal world of the spirits. Yes, well, but you're not right. drinking, Mr. Houdin. I never touch alcohol. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Crandon, uh, may I say, quite a library you have. Everything from the yes, scientific yes. to the occult. I, I wonder, have you read N.I. Crankshaw's book, Hocus Pocus? No, not yet. Oh, Interesting right. phrase, Thank Hocus you, Pocus. Right. It comes from the Latin mass. Mm. To be precise, hoc est corpus, meaning this is the body. Yeah. Referring, of course, to the magical transformation of the wafer into the body of Christ. Mm. But I don't suppose, Mr. Houdini, you know about that. You'd be surprised how much. My wife's Catholic. I'm at the Latin. You don't read it, do you? Uh, no. No, but uh, I do know German. I read about the meaning of Hocus Pocus somewhere. It, it wasn't in Huxley, was it? I notice you have all his books. I admire Huxley enormously. It was he, Mr. Munn, who said that those who refuse to go beyond fact rarely get as far as fact. Uh, Science can take us only so far. To rend the veil, we need art. Mm -hmm. Minna has art. So much so that others try to steal her secrets, employing people to snoop on her and other underhanded <laughs> methods. You see, I received a most disquieting telephone call from a friend, a Miss Caroline Churchill. You wouldn't know her, would you, Mr. Houdini? The only Churchill I know is uh, Churchill Downs. That's a racetrack. <laughs> she said that someone from your party had been to see her, asking questions about Minna and me. She's talking through her hat. Now, what is this, some kind of a gag? We come to dinner, you try to pull a fast one? No fast one, Mr. Houdini, just trying to ascertain your motives. You're barking up the wrong tree. Oh, Mr. Houdini, just as I'm sure that you know a great deal about Leroy and me, I know a few things about you. I know, for example, that you were born in Budapest. And, and not, as you insist, in Appleton, Wisconsin. What are you, joking? I'm an American, not an immigrant. I also know that you're a book collector and that Mr. Alfred Bex is your cataloger, the old gentleman whom you recently outbid for a collection he hoped to own for himself. Well, who do you hear that from? Well, the spirits, who else? It's not true. What? The spirits or what you did to Mr. Bass? Both. Oh, the spirits don't lie, Mr. Houdini. Did the spirits also tell you that I intend to donate all my books to the Library of Congress, to my country? And did they tell you that my collection on witchcraft and magic is the largest in the world? To say nothing of my drama collection, which is the world's fifth largest, or so I'm told? I also have first edition of Dickens, and my pride and joy a slew of Lincoln letters. Yeah. Quite impressive. You must find it intellectually stimulating to be so well-read. Yeah, sure. 
I mean, I, I read a lot, just as much as I can, but uh, when you're collecting books, you know, just can't keep up. <laughs> well, was the salad all right? It was yes. good. Uh, good. Very fine. Good. Thank Laura, you. will you save the main course now? Yes, uh, uh, Duck and wild rice from oh. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Crandon, I gather from a number of books in your library, uh, you're interested in death and resurrection. Oh, aren't you, Mr. Munn? Uh, oh, this is delicious. Dear. Yes, of course, yes. but uh, as a Christian, I am already mm -hmm. convinced of the life to come. <laughs> After all, Christ rose from the dead. As a Christian and a spiritualist, I'm doubly convinced. Well, certainly it has uh, never yet been proved that Christ did not rise from the dead. Ergo, he did. There, I agree with Mr. Houdini. Just because we can't prove the negative doesn't make the positive true. All these uh, miraculous stories, when you come to think about it, are the same thing. The great human theme, confinement and escape. You know, you know the greatest escape I ever made was getting out of the place where I worked as a kid? The tie factory. <laughs> <laughs> well, confinement takes many shapes. A bad marriage, poverty, illness, uh, ignorance, a boring job, and uh, worst of all, death. It's commonplace. There's nothing exotic about being confined. Being confined? No. Escaping, yes. Ah, every time Mr. Houdini escapes from a packing case or a mail bag or a milk can, isn't he escaping from boredom and authority and death? Uh -huh. Isn't he just acting out the rebirth of the sun and the seasons, as well as the belief in a risen God? What? The same is true of Minna. Every time she communicates with the spirits, that is, escapes from the bonds of the earth, isn't she proving the immortality hey, of hey, the hey, soul? Hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What I do is a trick. What she does, according to you, is now a miracle? Isn't the supreme trick of the magician to enter the world beyond, if only for a flickering moment, and then return? That's what Minna does in her seances. Isn't that, Mr. Houdini, what you do as well? Any so-called miracles I perform come not from the world beyond, but from thousands of hours of practice. Comes on, then you have magic, which sometimes, I admit, can resemble the miraculous. In that case, Minna must be a Sunday child, for she woke up one day to discover that she could speak to the spirits and witness the future. Uh, and, not, and not to be rude, uh, Dr. Cranon, uh, saying something's true doesn't make it so. What kind of proof will satisfy you? Your colleague, <clears throat> Mr. Burns? Unreliable. No training in these things. He takes too much on faith. Now, me, I believe only what I can see for myself. I guess you could say I'm uh, scientific-minded. Tomorrow night, at the seance, you will see the relationship of science and faith, the connection between the non-material world and our world, but only if you rid your mind of doubt. Mm. In other words, if I'm going to take communion, i got to believe in the hocus-pocus for it to work. <laughs> That's what my mother-in-law used to tell me. In spiritual matters, Mr. Houdini, the maxim is, I believe, therefore I know. It inspired men to build churches, write poetry, and go on crusades. Today, it inspires martyrs like Minna to brave the scorn of self-proclaimed debunkers so she can aid the many people who grieve for their lost dead. What? I believe, therefore I know. What greater model would you have? Just the opposite. I know, therefore I believe. My God, who was don't think I'll have an education to see how she has a buffalo. Yes, Harry, yes. Oh, oh hello. This is room uh, 610. Oh, I love this guy. Could please send up two beers. Uh, oh, no, no. No, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, make that a, a nice tier and a beer. Thanks. <clears throat> July in Boston. The only place worse is New York. Yeah, try Kansas. Then you'll know what it really means to be hot, huh? <laughs> yeah. It was in Kansas, Galena, Kansas, that I first tried my hand at this spiritualism crap. Huh? I went to all the cemeteries in the area and copied the names and the dates on the tombstones. And I visited the library, some library, and read through a lot of old newspapers. I also spent an afternoon sitting in the barbershop getting my hair cut and listening to the local gossip. What a lot of rubes. The night I did my shtick, the opera house was full. Half of them were believers, the rest uh, not knowing what the hullabaloo was about. At first, I talked about the spirit world. Mm. Then I closed my eyes. I opened them. I trembled. I said I could feel strange spirits in the air. I told him I could hear messages coming through. I, I named names, gave dates, told family secrets. I even described a slit throat of someone who'd been murdered only recently. <laughs> the opera house was in an uproar. People were screaming. <laughs> a few fainted. Some bolted out of the door. <laughs> <sighs> uh, America's a country full of suckers. You know that? Uh, yeah. Out of the sticks, Board of Indians, they have a saying. You know where the yokels go after they've been suckered? Back again for more. Back to town Lime Street. Uh, you ain't kidding. We got our hands full with these two, believe me. Yes. What surprised me was how much they had on you, Harry. They play the game magicians do. They have people everywhere feed them information. That's why exposing them ain't going to be so easy. Oh, oh yeah. Come in. Room service. Ice team, one beer. All right, here. Keep the change. Thanks. Say, 
This room with Mr. Houdini staying in. It's registered to me, son. Mr. Munn. Mr. Orson Munn. Sorry. Here, see what I mean? How do we know that kid ain't on the tape passing information to the crown? What, a bellboy? Orson in the magic business? You don't trust no one. Everyone's got a trick. Sure, Harry, Harry, you too. All right. Hmm. Now, let's get down to business. Right. At the seance, I'll sit on Minna's left, and you, Orson, sit on my left. Right. Jim will check all the doors and windows. Mm -hmm. Also check the closets and the heating registers. Sure. Put wax seals on all the doors and openings into the room. Mm -hmm. Look under the rug for wires. Feel the drapes to make sure nothing's sewn into the lining. Check the windows inside and out. Examine the lighting fixtures. Mm -hmm. And he mustn't forget to watch the house. If anyone enters or leaves during the seance, I want to know who it is. Hey. Uh, tell me, Harry, uh, what did your mother think about you pretending to be a medium? Don't ask. And next, for our distinguished guests, I'll set the spirits loose. Keep holding hands tightly. Remember, don't unclasp them under any condition. Watch out! The megaphone is flying through the air. Duck! I'll grab it! There. Got it. Where do you want it? Here. Oh. <laughs> Three-point landing on the table in front of Mr. Houdini. Not bad, eh? But the best is yet to come. Ah, the table's tipping. Perhaps I'll make it fly away. I'd like to see that. On second thought, I'll put the table down and give you something better. Oh, what was that? The folding screen. Don't panic. Keep holding hands. The spirits won't hurt you. They're just being playful. Hey, feel that, Mr. Houdini. One of the lively spirits just poked you on the leg. I'm not talking, eh? Marjorie, oh Marjorie, your alluring parts shine bright like a lovely fricassee. You invite my appetite. Walter. Did you hear the one about the single girl who goes for a stroll on a cold winter's night, leaving her gloves behind? <laughs> Result, she's got a chap on her hands the rest of her life. Get it? No lewdness, Walter. A chap on her hands. Serious, Walter, serious, please. Sounds like you and Minna. Look, behave, or else. A chap, a chap, get it? <laughs> a chap. <laughs> you sure it was all a fake, Harry? I'm certain no one came in or went out the entire time I was watching outside. Every last thing, Jim. Tricks, that's all it was. Tricks. Everything she did, I can do. The Copley Plaza driver. You go ahead. Uh, Harry, you saying something about your leg? All day today, on my right leg, I wore a rubber bandage. Uh -huh. See, I read of this. Oh, the yeah. bandage made the leg real tender, even though I can hardly touch it. Just before we left for Lime Street, I took off the bandage, and I sat down next to the minute before she put her leg against mine. I rolled up my trouser leg. Every time she moved a muscle, I felt it. And let me tell you, she moved plenty. Like when she ducked under the table to lift it with her head and back. And when she inched her foot away from mine to press the bell box on the floor. Yes. With her other leg, the one Dr. Cranham was supposed to have under his control but didn't, she tipped that folding screen. Mm -hmm. And then with her right hand, which Dr. Cranham let hold of, she put the megaphone on her head so that when the time was right, she could toss it on the table next to me. Yeah, uh, when you disengaged your hand from mine, what did you do? I bent down and felt under the table, and lo and behold, I brushed past Minna's right leg without her knowing it. Mm -hmm. Her leg was stretched out at full length. That's how she poked me and how I knew Dr. Cranham didn't have it in control. But then when I was feeling around under the table, her right hand for a moment gripped my left. What? She knows that I know. But she said nothing. Maybe she thinks Hardy's too great a gentleman to expose a lady. Fat chance. Yes, yes. Now I know why Walter made such a point about our holding hands. Sure. Minna didn't want anyone having a free hand to discover all the little tricks. Hmm. So what do we do now for the next stage of the investigation? As soon as we're back in New York, I want to guarantee next time she ain't free to tip no tables or make things fly about the room. How are you going to do that? By putting Minna under full control, especially her hands. Uh -huh. I ain't giving her no more quarter. This time I'm going to win. At any cost. I'll get it, Laura. Hello? Minna, Malcolm here. Where are you? The lobby of the Copley Plaza. Oh, what is it, Bertie? You sound alarmed. I, I just saw Orson Munn. We were discussing my continued association with the Scientific American, but that's not why I called. Oh, there's something wrong, I can tell. While I was talking to Orson in his room, I I overheard Houdini and Collins talking in the bedroom. Yes? Well, I couldn't hear real well, but they were talking about building a box for the seance next month. A wooden box for you to sit in, with only your head and hands exposed. Collins made some joke about a sweat box. Uh, did you hear anything else? Something about making sure the right people controlled your hands. Did Mum realize you could hear them? If he did, he never let on. Thanks, Bertie. You're a dear, dear friend. Really. 
Yes, well, uh, I'll call if I hear more. All right, bye-bye, Birdie. I... Thanks again. Can't you understand, Leroy? A wooden box! Next month, when he returns, he's bringing with him some contraption with openings only for my head and hands. Now, how in the world, Leroy, am I to function in a box with no room to move? Then I'll tell him. Oh, tell him what? That Walter performs sometimes, but not others, and that when he's misbehaving, I need to be free of my control? Sure, sure. He's really going to believe that story. Before you fly off the handle, remember how resourceful I can be. Have been. No. No surgery, Leroy. Not this time. I'm game for anything but that. There's no need to tamper with the storehouse. It's my body. You're jumping to conclusions. I simply Just said... Just because you're no longer interested doesn't mean that my enjoyment has to end. Minna, at the time you agreed... Because I was already scheduled for his threat. You me. agreed it was necessary for your calling. Oh, yes. But I sometimes wonder if you still believe in that calling. Your constant need of reassurance. If I didn't believe in the promise of an afterlife, I'd take my own life now. Then you do need me. More than ever. The table tipping and the bell ringing I know are just a little theater to amuse the literal-minded. But the crossing over, your incomparable genius at piercing the veil, that's what counts. Because of you, I know the great minds of this world are not lost to the earth's decay, but continue living in another realm. You can understand my concern, since you rarely... Thousands, millions reduce their love to the level of the animal world. We share something more important. A mission, a cause, a sacred duty to educate the world to spiritualism. I glory in the ridicule I receive when I insist the spirit world exists and your powers are legitimate. Yes, I know there are times you can't connect and must be free of your controls. But that just proves the difficulty of crossing over, which is as it should be. Besides, it's too late now to go back. That is why, if Houdini thinks his miserable wooden coffin will prove the death of Marjorie the medium, then he underestimates the depth of my conviction and the lengths to which I'll go to prove that the human spirit does not die. That I won't die. You know that beating Houdini means as much to me as it does to you. But what if I should fail, be branded a fraud? Oh, I couldn't stand to have my name in all the newspapers. My son reading terrible things about his mother. Don't let that happen, Leroy. Promise me. If you will promise me a change in Walter's attitude, I don't care for his comments about our sex life. It's unseemly. I'll tell him to behave. And, while you're at it, ask Walter about Houdini's sainted mother. If Walter could bring her spirit back, Houdini would be our friend for life. Bertie warned me not to But try. if you could, never forget, we hate those people who say they'll answer to our deepest needs and then betray us. But I know, Minna, you'd never be guilty of something like that, now, would you? Betray you? Never. I didn't think so. Now ask, Walter, once again, what I may hopefully expect when I cross over. A spirit life devoid of illness, impotence, and death. Devoid of illness, impotence, and death. Sweet love and great virility will be your everlasting stage. How I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. Get in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who is it? Dr. Crandon. Who? Leroy Crandon. What are you doing here? You're the last person I should come in. Yeah, sure. Can I order you something? No, thank you. How come you're here? What's up? I understand you and your party are returning to New York tonight. 7.15 train. I know how busy you must be. No big deal. Mun and Carl's with us for your Red Sox game. Oh, what? And some luggage you have. I admire fine leather valises. Italian. Bought them when I was in London. Not cheap, either. You're obviously a man of good taste. A gentleman. I assume I may speak to you as one. Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. 
They now tell me that you wish to test my wife by enclosing her in a specially built wooden box. Well, well, where it gets around. Fast as a speeding bird. Mr. Bird has nothing to do with it. I'll bet. In my opinion, to treat a woman in this manner constitutes behavior impossible for a gentleman. And since you are a gentleman, Mr. Houdini... A gentleman, yes, a sucker, no. I trust Mr. Houdini, but now you know my feelings, you will take a different course of action. One worthy of a gentleman. If being a gentleman means being a patsy, then I'm afraid I can't. Help you. Why do you need to go to such lengths? Oh, well, let's just say I got my doubts about your wife. Mr. Houdini, you may take my word for it, the word of a gentleman, that Mina is a genuine sensitive. If you shackle her, make her wear a wooden suit, just as if she were sitting in the stocks, your suspicions and her shame will affect the results of the experiment. I beg of you, play fair. Let the test take place without restraints. Otherwise, the results could easily be called in doubt. Oh, so that's the game. Threaten to cry foul if she can't make the spirits dance? Let me assure you, her ministry is genuine. And I have no doubt that despite the obstacles you put in her path, your committee will agree that Minna deserves the prize. Dr. Cranlon, if your wife can materialize objects out of thin air while locked in a box, I'll be the first to sign on the dotted line. She's for real. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me... Clearly, you know nothing about the new science of spiritualism. Let me tell you, when the committee votes to give her the award, you'll be a laughing stock. Now, let me tell you, if the committee, based on what I've seen so far, says she's legit, then they'll be laughing stock. To attack spiritualism, Mr. Houdini, is to attack both religion and the right of people to worship what they please. People can worship whatever they want. I don't give a hoot. But when they start advising others on the basis of what the spirits say, then I say... She's she paid nothing. Takes nothing, receives only the goodwill of those whom she has helped. The Churchill says, Then why do it? A desire to help others. The wish to communicate the good news that our spirit survives our death. There you are! That our spirit survives our death. It's cruel to lead people to think that they can talk to their dead departed friends and family like their fathers and their mothers. Not if it's true. It's not. You know? I know. She believes she can get in touch. She's utterly convinced, and so am I. But she's misguided, ill, and so are you. Look, I've got to get back to my packing. It's late. Then I'll be on my way. Oh. By the way, I meant to tell you, did you know that two of Lincoln's letters to Stephen Douglas were sold privately last month? Long letters in perfect condition. You're kidding Collectors all over America know I'm looking for Abe Lincoln's letters, so how come they don't tell me about it? Who bought them? Maybe I can make a deal. Perhaps you can. I know the buyer. Yeah, who? My wife, Minna Crandon. You're pulling my leg. They're at the house now. The ink hasn't faded a bit. Lincoln's signature looks as if he's just put pen to paper. How much do you want for them? They're yours. Free. If you leave Boston and never return. Bribery! <laughs> Oh, my God. Shall we say a gift for services unrendered? Whatever she paid, I'll double it. Not for sale. I could blow the whistle on you, attempt a bribery. Without witnesses, it's your word against mine. I'll make a deal. I'm listening. If your wife can bring objects out of every thinness while restrained in a box of my own design, I'll take out a full-page ad in the New York Times shouting she's for real. On the other hand, if she can't, she sells me, not gives me... Those letters for what she pay. What do you say? With my proposal, no one loses. You get your letters, and Minna gets left alone. With yours, it's up to Minna to perform, or else. But she also stands to gain something. My endorsement. <laughs> Let me tell you, the cost for a full-page ad ain't peanuts. It's your absence we want, not your endorsement. Take it or leave it. Some people would die for my support. But you know who I am? I'm Harry Houdini. Ah, perhaps it's the light. But the only person I see before me is an immigrant Jew. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Vice. He wouldn't budge. Even when... Even when I offered him the letters. Oh, marvelous. You got me into this mess. You get me out. For God's sake, Minna, stop playing that mindless piece. You're not a child. Then stop treating me like one, giving me orders and bossing me around. I don't like it. All right. He didn't take the letters. Well? Well? 
Minna. What are you going to do? Minna, may I remind you, it's not I who have the gift of spiritualism. It's you. Oh, Mother warned me. Earl warned me. I thought it would be wonderful for you to share your gifts with others. And thereby bring attention to yourself. That's ungenerous of you, Minna. To suggest my motives were personal. You love the role of persecuted scientist. Oh, admit it, Leroy. You love lecturing people about the spirit world, you and Conan Doyle. You're never happier than when you're telling scientific groups that they're behind the times. And you sitting there in your see-through gown, you don't like the oohs and ahs and the tears and the smiles of devoted of citizens? Of course I do. And so do you. It excites you to see other men ogling me. The only thing that you'd like better would be to watch. Just don't forget what life was like as a greengrocer's wife. You haven't done so badly for yourself. Nor have you. Maybe you'd like to go back to living over the stink and trash of a grocery store and hosing down the spuds. Back to that common little man, Earl Rand. Let's not spout, Leroy. You know I hate it. That's better. I get so upset when you and I have words. I, I, I don't know what comes over me. Normally we have so much in common. I can see how this Houdini matter has upset you. Why not spend the afternoon with Birdie? You always seem to find such comfort, such satisfaction in his company. He clearly gives you things I cannot. Oh, hug me, Leroy. I was wrong to yell at you about Houdini. I, I was unnerved by what I heard about his wooden box. I'll be guided by you. I'll spend the afternoon entertaining myself with Birdie. He's impossible. Simply impossible. You know, he behaves as if he owns me. We've nothing in common. Oh, it's been so muddy. About you. God, for this downpour, it clears my head. What were you talking about, Birdie? You. Us. Oh, maybe I'd better listen. Start again. I want to tell my wife that I've met someone else. Someone I care for very much. Why do that? Well, these last few weeks, the, the closeness, the intimacy, the love. Oh, stop it, Bertie. You'll have me crying in my beer. Who said anything about love? Not said. Did. Oh, I see. And on the basis of a few turns between the sheets, you intend to break up your marriage and mine? Forget it. I have covered that ground before. One divorce but is all, enough. all these afternoons, what were we doing if not courting? Entertaining ourselves in order to get through the long, hot summer. You mean all the intimacy we shared was nothing but a game? Everything's a game, Bertie. Love, marriage, the spirits, everything. What matters is playing by the rules. Good form. Style. Style is the only... But fact. you said you had nothing in common with Leroy. That's no reason to run away with you. Then it was nothing but a... a dalliance? Oh, Bertie... Why spoil the good feelings between us by falling in love? Since when does falling in love spoil love? When it means living on $30 a week in a walk-up apartment in a run-down neighborhood. You think I'm an awkward lover, is that it? Oh, I told you, Bertie, it's a class thing. Money, position, prestige, nothing personal. You seem to take pleasure in our lovemaking. Pleasure? <laughs> I've learned to play the part. Surely you must have guessed. I'm surgically impaired. Everything cut. Well, perhaps you didn't notice. It was not for me to say. But you could tell. Well? Yes. Why, Minna? Leroy. Leroy? Who else? But he's your husband. Why? Because I was young. Impressionable. Wanted to, to please my husband out of bed as well as in. But since the surgery, he finds little pleasure in my body. But I find even less. I still don't understand why you would... Agree. Leroy told you, if the seance fails, I need a bag of tricks, a hiding place. You can't be serious. Bertie, Bertie, hug me. Minna. Not another word. There. Leroy will be going out later this afternoon. We'll make love again. And I will try with all my heart to remember how it used to feel. You have to give me the strength to face up to Houdini and his horrid little test. That's right. That's right. You're ready. Right, right. 
Uh, that way she ain't near a light switch, drapes, or furniture. Free floating. If I repeat, it. this is our way. You heard you the first time, Malcolm. Now don't forget the pillow for her feet. In the entire history of spiritualism, no medium has ever been made to sit in a, a sweat box. It looks like it came out of some sleazy health spa, Mr. Munn. Either this so-called test is cancelled and men are allowed to perform unimpeded or... Or I resign as secretary of the Scientific American. Uh, Malcolm, I'm tired of your posturing. Leave, I accept your resignation. You, yes, I, yes, I, you threaten for the last time. Well, I guess then there's nothing more to say. Is there? Good luck in your new job, whatever it is. Right. Now, mm. now Jim, Jim. Yeah. Uh, make sure that the chair is held fast to the bottom of the box. Mm -hmm. I don't want it moving about. And be sure also it's in a direct line with the armholes and placed right under the head hole. I don't want to hear him to complain that we tortured it, okay? It's fine, Harry. Fine exactly as you want it. Right. Now, now, Jim, mm -hmm. during the seance, I want you next door. You don't let anyone enter or leave this room unless I give the okay. You understand? Got it, Harry. Right. Hey, so you'll miss the show. One of the drawbacks of a working man. Is this it? Don't worry, dear. You'll be all right. I'll stand behind the box to make sure you're treated fairly. Well, I have just been subjected to an anatomical examination, and now this? How can I materialize objects and levitate others if I'm encased in a coffin? To exercise my powers, I require space. But just try. For me, please. I beg you. If the seance fails to work, don't blame me. Now, Mrs. Crandon, if you'll climb into the box and sit down, I'll secure the doors. Why don't you just tie my hands and gag me? I apologize for any inconvenience, but you can understand the scientific American must be sure. Now, if you'll extend your arms through the holes. Mr. Houdini will mm -hmm. hold your left hand, and I will hold your right. Now, Dr. Crandon, if you'll be so kind as to switch off the lights. Of course. You got hold of her right hand? Yes. You are not to let go under no circumstances. Of course not. Not even if she wants to scratch herself. I quite understand. Hold tight then. He heard you the first time. Why keep repeating this? If you smuggle something into the box, you won't be able to reach it if your hands are being held, will you? I suggest then we start again. And this time, Mr. Houdini, you search me inside and out. Uh, look, uh, uh, forget this physical examination stuff. I'm no doctor. Then quit complaining and let me try and summon Walter. Just as I predicted, nothing's happened. No table tipping, no flying objects, no bell ringing. Oh, very clever, very clever indeed. But it won't work. Won't work? What won't work? What are you talking about? This. I suppose it was an accident that this thing was left in the box. What thing? While Mita was being searched, your assistant was fixing up the box. Jim Collins was the one who bolted the chair down. So? And the one who put the pillow inside. So? And the one who put under the pillow a folding roller. All in order to throw suspicion on my sister. Houdini, get the hell out of here and never come back. Because if you don't, I will, you goddamn bastard! Oh, this is terrible. My dear Satan mother was married to my father. Don't try and laugh off your deceit, Houdini. What about the six-inch folding ruler? I don't know what you're talking about. Turn on the lights. Let everyone see how Houdini has tried to discredit my little sister. Get me out of this goddamn awful box. Right away. I'll do it. Right. Now, Olsen, the collars in here. Yes, yes. Jim, come in, please. See? See, a ruler. Walter was right. A folding ruler under the pillow in the box. What's the matter? Jim. You know what that ruler got there? I know. It's not mine. I've got ruler on me now. Take a look. Oh, Mr. Houdini, I know how this game is played. After the seance is over, the ruler's found, and then I'm accused of putting it in my mouth and using it to ring the bell, touch people on the head, and knock over different objects. But this time, Mr. Houdini, you overstepped yourself. Where was the ruler supposed to come from? Hmm? Nice talking? Hardly. Not after Matron conducted a body search. You are coming, Mr. Houdini. 
very cunning. Plant a ruler in the box so that anything my wife does can be labeled trickery. Nothing like sowing the seeds of failure in advance. Right down to Mr. Collins here, just happening to have his ruler in his pocket. Now, just a minute. But do you always carry a ruler with you when you go out at night, Mr. Collins? Only when I might be called upon to do some carpentry like this evening. And let me remind you, Cranon, that tonight's seance was a blank. A blank not because men have found a ruler, but because we held her hands. I don't believe any medium could manifest under the conditions to which my wife has been subjected. Mediums, no, but Harry Houdini, yes. I'm no medium, but if you strip me naked, search me yourself everywhere. And held my hands, you on one side, Minna on the other. I could still ring a bell, tie knots and handkerchiefs, and do any number of tricks, all of which would occur outside the box. You must have psychic power. No! I'm just a magic man. And if you'd like to put me to the test, I'll perform right now. That wouldn't prove a thing. Oh, yes, it would. It would prove that all these things that you call spirit can be done by trickery. I simply don't understand why you refuse to acknowledge that you're one of us. You are, you know. And if you give me the chance, I'll prove it. Anytime. Someday, you will see the light. And when that day happens, I will gladly make out a check for charity to $10,000. It may happen, but don't hold your breath. I repeat, $10,000 for charity. I'm off for giving bucks to charity. But you'd both be better off giving yourself to the truth. Now, let's get out of here. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. I give the world to be just a minute. Oh. Hello. You said any time when I asked for the chance to prove to you that you have psychic power, so here I am. It's late. Almost nine o'clock. Since there's no danger of our being overheard, I suggest, Mr. Houdini, that we speak plainly. Sure. Isn't it possible for a man to be a very powerful medium all his life and yet never realize that his gifts are supernatural? Look, lady, I know how I do my tricks just as you, and I know how you do yours. If you're saying that we have much in common, I agree. I'm saying we're both in the same business. Magic. I told you that this afternoon. <laughs> magic. You call what we have accomplished magic? No, no. We are God's chosen. How else do you account for our miraculous escapes? You from H. Richter's son's necktie cutter and me from being a grocer's wife. Let me tell you, Harry. You don't mind, do you, if I call you Harry? What's the mind? America is needle and thread, backaches and ten cents an hour. Believe me, we are God's chosen. Just think of all the people who aren't chosen. Yeah. In the tie factory, I know one. I shared a bench with him, a rabbi, my father. So, you see... We have a great deal in common through our spiritual gifts. We have both cast off the shackles of poverty and obscurity. But you met Crandon before this spirit stuff. You were wealthy without it. True. Then why take it up? At first, for kicks. But then later, Leroy threatened to leave and reduce me to nothing if I didn't perform. The public seances then are, are his idea, not yours? He's terrified of death, of dying. So... so you, you, you perform To prove to him the human spirit is immortal, that it lives on, that he'll live on. You tell him these things even though you know they're all untrue? <sighs> Harry, I'll take you at your word. You say you don't have psychic powers. I'll believe you. But that doesn't mean that I can't summon the spirits of the dead. Now get off it, Minna. I know all the tricks. If I can't cross over, then no one can. No one! I can. I really can cross over. That's genuine. What do you think you're talking to, Minna? Some greenhorn? Don't tell me you communicate with the spirits. All right. The music and the mischief, the pigeons and the poking, the table wrappings and the table turning, all those things are trickery. I admit it. I said so from the start. The ruler. The, the, the ruler you claim we hid in the box? Yes. <laughs> Hidden in my body. In? Your body? D -d -d Did you say in? In. Well, never mind. That's... Not discuss it. Leroy's idea. No, 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 don't tell me. It's repulsive, ghoulish. Anything to help the spirits, he said. Then he knows it's all a fraud. The tricks, yes, but not the crossing oh, over. Man, stop it! Stop pretending! There is no crossing over! Now that you've told half the truth, when I told all, we cannot reach the dead. No one can. Now, please, I want you to leave. You want to reach your mother? You want to talk to Mama Weiss? How dare you? You need only ask her. Get out. Go! I have tried a thousand times only to be cheated. Not again. Not this time. Every time you fail, death wins. Isn't that the way it feels? I hate it. Draw the curtains and turn off the light. 
I said, draw the curtains and turn off the light. God, not again. But this time, it will all be different. Sit down. Sit down next to me here on the bed. Now, just relax. When I, when I ask you to give me your hand, just do as I say. So many times before. You must not withdraw it. Do you understand? Yes. Walter, you ought to run an errand for me. You needn't answer or appear. Call the spirit of Cecilia Steiner Weiss. Send her to me, and quickly. Give me your hand. <gasps> Why are you resisting? Flesh. I've taken off my dress to be more <gasps> comfortable. When summoning the spirits, I always strip away the inessentials. You know that. I'd rather you didn't. Shh. Are you there? If you're there, speak to me. Speak! Glaube, Erich. Glaube, wir werden bald zusammen sein. Together again? When, M Mother, when? Answer me. Oh. She spoke to you in German. In her own language. In her own voice. Now do you believe? Harry. Forget! I've learned myself the trickery will I never learn. Fraud, fraud, fraud. How dare you make me think play in my hopes. Use me, vulture carrying it a ship bird. Oh, my God. Look what you made me do, dear Mama. You didn't hear me say that word. I never swear. You know that, Mama. By calling to your mother, you prove that you believe. No, no, no. If I can't get through, then no one can. The violence of your no merely shows how much you want spiritualism to be true. You want it. Just as you want me. No, I don't. I swear on my mother's name. I know that you abhor sweat and nudeness. Have you ever caressed bountiful breasts? Your wife is, I know, flat-chested. Surely, though, you must have fondled others. Feel mine. I'll take you. No, let, me, let me go. You've escaped from every kind of fetter, Harry, but you'll not escape from my Eucharistic body. I can't breathe. I'll give you life. I'll introduce you to the spirits. You'll never die. There, there now. Doesn't that feel good? Oh, I'm dying. No, no, you're just beginning to live. Death is the only enemy. We must show death that life is stronger. Spiritualism gives life. Sex. Oh, you can smell it. The scent is in the air, Harry, and the wonder. And at your side is the touch of the beautiful lady. I, I, I hate it. Sweat. Nudity, the sex. I hate it. I hate you. You cannot escape, Harry. You cannot escape death, Harry, except through me. I must find the light. I will escape. The voice you heard coming through the dark was your mother's. I commanded it, and just as I summoned the spirits of the dead, I can foretell the future. No. You're nothing but a bunk of water. It's a fraud. Call me what you like, Harry, but I know that you will die on Christmas Day, 1925, or shortly thereafter. You, you can't know that. It's a trick. You can't predict the future. At last, the light. You cannot escape, Harry. The light is only temporary. I brought your mother back, and I can do the same for you. But you must believe in me. Never! If anyone can return from the dead, I can. Not you. I am the great escaper.
I was told that at 1.26 p.m. on that afternoon, Houdini had died. His death had come ten months later than I predicted, on October 31st. Ironically, on Halloween. When asked for a statement, I replied without thinking, hoc est corpus, and then joined Leroy in the music room to plan our trip to Europe where I had promised seances to princes, professors, prime ministers. Their faith in me, I have no doubt, persuaded Leroy of his immortality. You really are remarkable, Minna. You do have power over life and death. I have no doubt your name will be remembered long after Harry Houdini is forgotten. No doubt. I was now the toast of Europe and America. Marjorie the medium, as Bertie had called me who'd confounded the great Houdini and predicted his death. I harbor no ill will. May his soul return. May all our souls return. Shelley Thompson played Minna, John Woodvine, Leroy Crandon, and Nigel Anthony, Harry Houdini, in The Witch of Beacon Hill by Paul M. Levitt. Birdie, Kerry Shale, Laura, Jane Slavin, Caldwell and Earl Rand, Vincent Brimble, Reg Gray and Munn, Brian Miller, Mrs. Corbridge and Cecilia Weiss, Helen Horton, James Collins, Joe Dunlop, George, Ian Target, Caroline Churchill and Mrs. Stinson, Hilda Schroeder, Winifred Churchill, Barbara Atkinson, Henry and the radio interviewer, Paul Downing. The Witch of Beacon Hill was directed by Martin Jenkins. <laughs>